You know, I, I really want to mention Medicaid, and because I work for an independent living center out of Superior, we're lucky enough to have uh, some great people on our board. We're an agency that helps people live in the community. I, I firmly believe there's a lot of money to be saved in You're Medicaid. Right. Yes. But making it into a block grant program for the states, I don't think that's the right way to do it. And it scares the bejesus out of us. Because I think what we need is a level playing field. And I'd really like the opportunity to, for you to use us and our SILs as a resource. I'll come in. If you'd let me come and see you, I'd love to see and engage further in the conversation. I'll just tell you off the top of my head what I'm thinking for this. So we're talking about Medicaid. You know, obviously, what the more people we get on Medicaid, um, in the state, there's a, there's a matching process, right? So there's an incentive almost to uh, potentially, if you, if you get more people on, you, the state doesn't pay all the bill, the feds come in and match it. There becomes odd incentives in that. And what I would say, I mean, the people I've talked to says, is, listen, take all the strings away from these bureaucrats in Washington. Give us the power at the local level to spend the money the best way possible, and, and all these dollars continue to increase over time, but it's saying, listen, get the Washington bureaucrats out of the way, because they don't know what's best for us in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin's not like Mississippi or Kentucky or Kansas. Give them the money and let them use it. I'm not saying cut it, but I'm saying be more effective with it. That's the, that's the proposal that I'm willing to come in. If you let me come and see you, I, I would love to sit and have a conversation and get a better education, give me your card. But that's, it's trying to be, how can we be the most effective with these dollars and encourage our states to be as responsible as possible with this money? I just, uh, we toured a facility today um, where we have um, disabled folks working, um, making great product, making a, a living, being productive in their communities. Um, and they are funded in part through Medicaid dollars. It was a beautiful, beautiful program. Um, my niece is involved in the same program up in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, who she's picked up by a bus and goes to work. She makes 20 bucks a week, and it's the most beautiful thing that she makes 20 bucks a week. Her standard of living is going through the roof. I get it. I see it firsthand in my own family. I'm just going, how can I want, my, my deal is this. If we fail, at, and we, if we fail at this debt issue, um, we may in this room disagree on who needs help. But we would all agree there's a certain segment of the population that needs our help. None of us would disagree on a certain set of people. As we go up the rung of economic um, levels, we may disagree as we get up. But on those basic levels, if we fail in regard to this debt, I'm concerned what happens to the people who truly need our help. That's my concern. I'll take one more question. How come we have proven cures for people with medical disabilities that have been diabetes and cancer, and they are proven, but we're not able to use them. There was a diabetic cure created two years University back. of Minnesota Duluth, <coughs> and it's been researched, and it was, you know, they, they tested it on people that worked fine. It's a diabetes cure. It's a single shot. It's isolate cells from pigs. I, think that's, I don't know about it. If you, if you would give me your information, was, I'd love to get, get... It was on the internet and everything for years. We even talked to our paid doctor, Donald it, Blair. It was supposed to be released, the cure for people. There are people who have been tested and used it, and it's working. <coughs> and it was supposed to come out within four years from the time that they now released the years. information. If you would give me the information, I'd, like, I'd love to look into, look into it. I'll give you my email address. You can send it to me as well. Let me just, let me just say, I... I um, I appreciate y'all coming out. Uh, obviously, we didn't all agree here tonight. Uh, I'm going to tell you this. You don't ask me the easiest, easiest questions. <laughs> obviously, I'm in the hot seat. But I have the utmost respect for this position and for all of you. And I'm going to continue to go around and have town hall meetings and coffees with your congressmen to engage in these conversations. I think I owe it to you to come and answer your questions and tell you what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing and hear where you're coming from and where you disagree with me. And I guess I will, I'll leave you with this thought. Um, I believe that if we don't get this right, um, there are significant consequences for our future generations. Actually, there's future consequences right around the road for us. And I guess I would say 50 years from now, there won't be anyone who remembers any of us in this room. They won't know any of us. They won't think of us. But they will know whether we succeeded in this great mission of getting our debt under control because it will have a direct impact on the way they lead their lives, on their prosperity, and on their opportunity. And uh, I'm going to work my heart out every day to make sure we get this under control, to have pro-growth policies, to make sure that we have an economy that is growing and putting our, our families back to work.
putting uh, good jobs back into our community. And uh, with that, uh, I thank you all for coming out. I'm going to be around for a little while after if you want to ask me a question.